Hello CFA friends. Uh, in this quantitative methods reading we are going to look at time series analysis. So let's get started. Right, well let's start by having a little bit of an overview of what uh, we are going to be looking at. So first of all there are a couple of families of models. The first one is called trend models. In a trend model the independent variable x actually becomes time. Now remember time series is going to be looking at the evolution of a variable over time. So essentially the independent variable becomes time, trend models. Now within trend models we've got linear trend models uh, which essentially mean that the dependent variable is a linear relation, has a linear relationship with time, and then we've got a log linear trend model where we potentially see exponential growth. So just to be more concrete, in a linear trend model, uh, uh, the, um, there is constant absolute change. Okay, so the y variable changes in a constant fashion in absolute terms. I'll see an example in a minute, don't panic. In long linear trend models, again we've got the word constant, but it's constant rate of change. So the absolute change is not necessarily constant, but the rate of change is. So this is the sort of relatively easier models to grasp and then you've got the so-called lag models or autoregressive models. This is where we no longer have distinction between y and x. There's essentially x at time t driven by x at time t minus 1 etc. Okay so for example in this kind of models we forecast sales of a company next year by looking at what sales are this year in its simplest form. Now, okay, more concretely, what is a time series? Let's start with some basic examples of time series. Okay, quarterly sales over the last five years, over time. Monthly consumer price index over the last 12 years, over time. Daily returns over the last six months, over time. Right, so it's the evolution of various variables over time. That is what a time series is. We start with our basic linear trend model. Okay, so what are the key points we need to know? The independent variable is time. There you go, that's your x, it's time. And also y is linearly dependent on this time. Okay, so in these models we've got the absolute change in the y variable is constant over time. And this change is actually represented by the B1. So, for example, what could be a concrete example of a linear trend model? Okay, so let's say I'm driving my car, okay, on the motorway. And I maintain a constant speed of 90 kilometers per hour. So, essentially, 90 kilometers per hour would be my absolute change in the distance that I travel over time. So my B1 will be 90 kilometers per hour. So think about what's going to happen. In one hour during my journey, when t is equal to 1, I'd have traveled the first 90 kilometers. In two hours, I'd have traveled twice the 90 kilometers, so 180. So that is what we mean by linear trend model. Y, which is, in our case, the distance traveled, is linearly dependent to time and the change is constant as denoted by the slope B1. Of course, you can come up also with more financial examples, more relevance, how we can be measuring things like unemployment or consumer price index. Log linear trend models. Well, now this again is looking at an independent variable having to do with time. But the key point here is that we've got exponential growth going on. So in other words, if this is my y variable and this is time, I'm not going to see a line. 
I'm actually going to see a curve, an exponential curve. And if I wanted to describe this with an equation, that's the equation of a log linear trend model. So y will be a function of magic number e, which of course is the inverse of the natural logarithm, to the power b0 plus b1t. Now notice something interesting. This reminds us of the equation of a line. So what we can do at this point is we can take the natural logarithm of both the left and right hand side of this equation. And so the left hand side simply becomes the natural logarithm of y. The right hand side, if we take the natural logarithm of e to the power of something, we actually get as the result the actual power. So we end up having our equation of a line. And that is why we call this type of model log linear. We call it log linear because the log of y is linearly distributed. Even though y itself is not a line uh, uh, with respect to time, the log of y is a line with respect to, to time. Now, also, it's important to understand the meaning of B1, the slope in a log linear trend model. So that B1 here is the constant, continuously compounded rate of growth. So again, practical examples of what we might model this way is, okay, let's go back to the good old days of biology, high school biology, bacterial growth. Bacteria is going to grow exponentially. More financial example, again, portfolio returns. Right? The dollar value, the, the dollar value of your portfolio may exhibit exponential growth. You could, for example, say, my portfolio is growing at a constant rate of 10% per annum in the long term. It's exponential growth. Right, and of course, serial correlation rears its ugly head again, even in this particular reading. So what we're doing here is basically saying that the regression errors in the current period, i.e. the epsilon t, must not be correlated with the regression errors from prior periods. So for example, the correlation of epsilon t and epsilon t minus 1 has to be zero. Right? No serial correlation. Now, of course, when you talk about serial correlation and you think, how could I test that? Of course, Durbin Watson comes to mind. Now, Durbin Watson continues to be our preferred choice for a test of serial correlation, at least at this stage. So, uh, the way the analyst proceeds at this stage is they take normally uh, the linear trend model first, because this is the simplest of them uh, models, certainly simpler than the log linear model, and then the analyst looks at whether this model works. And to know whether the model works, the analyst uses Durbin-Watson to test for serial correlation. And what, what could happen is that they discover that the linear trend model exhibits serial correlation. Well, if that is the case, um, you might think, okay, what could be causing this problem? And I think the next slide is going to help us. So I'll come back to this, but I want to show you some pictures. So if you, if you take, for example, this relationship here, which is clearly exponential, so this could be the dollar sales of a successful company over time. And now, if I wanted to model this with a line, I'm going to get all these errors which are negative, followed by all these errors which are positive, further down the line. So you can see my error term in the regression is non-random. Not only that, but negative errors today trigger more er negative errors tomorrow. Positive errors today trigger more positive errors tomorrow. So we've got an example of positive serial correlation in this picture. And the way we would want to fix that problem, if we were to suspect exponential growth was the cause of the problem, is of course to take the natural logarithm of y, because that would transform the model into a log linear trend model. So if all that bothered us was 
exponential growth, taking the natural law should fix it. Indeed, in this particular case, it did, because now you can see the errors are quite random and nicely well behavedly clustered around the regression line. So, of course, as you may imagine, we would have tested with Durbin Watson again and would have discovered that there was no serial correlation in the log linear trend model. Sometimes, however, things don't work out so perfectly. So, even after trying a log linear model, you may still be exhibiting autocorrelation, at which point you need to sophisticate things a little bit, you need to spice things a little bit by trying an even higher order mo uh, model, a uh, more sophisticated model called autoregression. And that's where we are headed next, pretty much. So that is your autoregressive model. So in an autoregressive model, as I told you earlier, there's no longer a distinction between x and y. There is x at time t and x at a prior time. So let's take our simplest form, AR1 model. What that means, this number here, the order of the model, essentially tells me how many lagged variables I will be using in this model. So, in this case, there is only one lagged variable of the x variable. So I'm going to try to forecast tomorrow's sales, for example, by looking at an intercept, a slope, and my independent variable will be essentially the same thing, sales, but from today. So I'm going to take today's sales in order to forecast tomorrow's sales. And of course, the usual suspect is here. We've got an error term because no model is perfect. Now, of course, more generally, we can come up with an AR model, autoregressive model of order P. So, if you want it, you could have 10 legged variables. There you go. So, that's a more generic version of the same animal. Now, of course, for this models to work, one very big condition has to be met. That is the con condition of covariance stationarity. Okay. I may sound a little bit scary, but there's very concrete three bullet points that you need to be familiar with in order to cover that concept. So, what is a covariance stationary time series? So, it's basically a series that has a constant mean, constant variance, and constant covariance across observations. Okay? Now, let's, let's actually show you concretely on a picture what that might look like. So, I might want to model my variable across time. And I want to see a constant mean. I want to see a constant mean. So, if my variable was doing this, why, well, that's not a very good candidate for a covariance stationary process. Because basically, there is no mean reversion. The variable is not trying to mean revert to its mean. Okay, let's say the mean could be zero. So, what could be a little bit more covariance stationary? Well, covariance stationary series might look like that. Something that oscillates around its mean, but it certainly reverts to that mean value of zero. So, that, that will satisfy the first condition, that of constant and finite mean. Because zero is finite and it's constant. Now, what about constant and finite variance? Well, that means that we don't want, of course, as time goes on, for the variance to increase and eventually get infinite. That, as you may imagine, would be a bit of a problem. We want, as time goes on, variance to remain constant. In practice, what that means is we want our variable to oscillate within a constant bound, with a constant range, as it does in a particular case. And the third condition was that a constant covariance. So, we want the various leg values to have constant covariance. Think about it. 
if covariance and correlation are changing over time, well then what hope are we going to have to use this time series model to forecast anything? So we do want some stationarity. And this is called covariance stationary. So for your autoregressive models that behave as you want them to, they got to be covariance stationary. And if they're non-stationary, then the results will be meaningless. So you can still get T's and F's and whatnot, but those R squares and all those ANOVA outputs will be meaningless. Okay, but suppose for the moment we've got a model that works. It's an AR1 model. In other words, we are using the same variable and a lag of it, and we only have one lag. Okay, intercept plus slope times x t minus 1. So what could that be? Let's say exchange rates, right? Let's say exchange rates. So let's say today's exchange rate is spot 5150. What is the forecast of the exchange rate tomorrow? And then what is the forecast of exchange rate the day after tomorrow? So tomorrow is known as the one step ahead forecast because we only want to get to tomorrow. That's one step. So we plug today's value of the exchange rate to get tomorrow's estimate. And then to get the day after tomorrow, we plug tomorrow's estimate into the same model and we get the two-step ahead forecast. Okay, but that assumes this is a well-behaved covariance stationary model with a mean reverting level. In fact, this model has a mean reverting level and we shall learn how to compute that mean reverting level in just a little while. However, again, serial correlation is something that we need to pay attention to. And I need to start you off with the most important point, I believe, on this slide. That of the fact we cannot use Durbin Watson anymore. So Durbin Watson was good in multiple regression. Durbin Watson was good in linear trend models. Durbin Watson was good in log linear trend models. But Durbin Watson does not work well with auto regression because in the simplest way to explain this, auto regression is a completely different sort of ball game, right? We no longer have y versus time. We've got x versus x is a different model. Durbin Watson does not fare so well here. So what we do is we resort to something that hopefully should be quite familiar to you, the good old t-test. And we perform this t-test on the residual oral correlations. What that basically means is that I compute a t-value on the correlation between epsilon at time t and let's say epsilon at time t minus 1. It doesn't have to be t minus 1. It could be t minus 2, more generically t minus n. The point is I am looking at those other correlations, but not only looking at them, I actually compute a t, t test on it. I perform a proper hypothesis test as you guys are well accustomed to. And of course, if I discover that serial correlation exists, then obviously my model is incomplete and I need to fix it. Now don't get confused. With Durbin Watson, we, 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 could, we could potentially uh, look at, at, at the Hansen method in multiple regression, but this is not what we do here. We're not using Durbin Watson, we're using a t-test. So there's a very, very specific way in which we're going to want to fix the model if we discovered serial correlation. And the fix involves improving the model by adding more legs. So suppose the analyst started with an AR1 model. This is a model that only has one leg variable. Essentially what the analyst now discovers is some serial correlation, which is a problem. So the analyst improves the model by adding one more leg, going up to an AR2 model. And of course, then the analyst retests for the presence of serial correlation by the t-tests. We'll do all that with concrete examples. Now another possibility 
could be that the serial correlation existed because of seasonality and that also can be fixed for by adjusting the order of the model. We shall see an example of that. Now let's start with something concrete. All right, A R1 model. Let me show you the formula again. X at time t is B0 plus B1 xt minus 1 plus epsilon t is your AR1 model, right? That's your basic AR1 model. Now, what we're going to do here? In this model, what we're interested in is the residual order correlations. So, we're going to prepare a table, lag 1, 2, 3, 4. Probably the reason why we're preparing four lags is because this AI1 model is based on quarterly data. So, with quarterly models, you normally want to go back at least four quarters and see what the other correlations are across the past four quarters. So, leg one essentially refers to the correlation between epsilon at time t and epsilon t t minus one. Leg two refers to the correlation between epsilon t and epsilon t minus two. Let me do one more. Leg three refers to the correlation between epsilon t and epsilon t minus three. I'm sure you get the idea by now what leg four would do, okay? So these are the actual values of the order correlations. Now remember, what would be my null hypothesis as we know it? The one researcher would be testing. H naught is correlations, all these correlations are equal to zero. That's desirable. We actually don't want to reject that now. Reject that now and you've got serial correlation. So you don't want to reject it. You want to fail to reject it. Now you look at these numbers and you ask yourself, are these numbers significantly different from zero? So for example, take this number, 0.1884. Is this different from zero? Well, I don't know. I got to perform a test. So what else am I going to need? So I've got the correlations. I need the standard errors of those correlations. So here are the standard errors. They're all the same because they follow the simple formula 1 over square root n. So in this, in this case, we're told that the sample size is 50. So 1 over square root of 50 happens to be spot 14, 14. And finally, we need to get to the t stats. Now, here's the formula we use for the t stats. The T statistic, the computed T statistic, takes the correlation between epsilon T and epsilon T minus N, I'm going to keep it in general here, and then divides by the appropriate standard error. That's what it's doing. So you try it on your calculators now and convince yourselves that by taking this number and dividing it by this number, you actually end up getting 1 spot 3324, right? So that is how we work out the T stats. Now you're probably thinking, okay, Martin, am I going to be looking at computing every single number in this table? And the answer is probably not, probably not. A, the autocorrelations will have to be given anyway. But look, the T statistics are normally given as well because effectively that is the output from your bread and butter regression packages. So really the job of the analyst at this stage is to focus on the last column and analyze those t statistics. Your job is to look at them and to tell me if there's any problem. Do you see any problems in these four pieces of data? Think about it. And as you think about it, remember what your now hypothesis is saying. That is your now. Correlation is zero. Think about if you are going to reject that now at any of these lengths. Well, the answer is, and of course, for you to give me that answer, you must remember that your magic critical T value is 2. That is for your base case, 5% significance, two-tailed test, large sample. And essentially, the only time you've exceeded that magic number two 
was on lag 2. So in other words, what he discovered is significant residual autocorrelation between the error term today, the error term two periods ago. And that is a problem. It d please remember, you, you don't have to reject the null at all levels. Only one of them is needed for the entire model to fall apart. So, you've rejected the null at leg 2, that means your model won't work. So, you gotta fix it. The model's currently incorrectly specified. Typically, that occurs because data is still missing. So you've only used one lag, you've omitted an important variable, we've mentioned that buzzword before, omission of important variable, and therefore that omitted variable is currently showing up as an error term. And therefore the error term is not genuinely random. So we're going to fix that by improving the specification of the model, improving the order of the model. So I'm going to start we're going to try an AR2 model, i.e. add a lag. Okay, so what might an AR2 model look like? We're going to look at x at time t being a function of b0 plus b1 xt minus 1, and that is your first leg, plus b2 xt minus 2, and that is your second leg. And of course, if you want, you can stick in your good old friend error. Now, uh, once you've built that AR2 model, what you would want to do is you would want to recompute the other correlations, the standard errors, and ultimately the t statistics. And again, your job is to focus on this last column. Have a look at it and tell me what you think. Okay? Are these t statistics significant, first of all? Well, the answer is they are all below the absolute value of 2. So, if I go back to my now hypothesis of correlation equal to 0, I will fail to reject that null hypothesis. And in this case, that would mean that none of these numbers were actually statistically significantly different from 0. And that is actually good news, because you can now go ahead and use this AO2 model in the real world. Now, moving on to that issue of mean reversion. Remember, when we talked about covariance stationarity, we said that one of the conditions of covariance stationarity is that the model must have a constant and finite mean, and therefore it should over time revert back to its mean. Now, how do we work out that mean reverting level for a simple AR1 model? So, uh, first of all, visually, if I had a variable up there, i.e. above the mean reverting level, I would expect, obviously, that value to decline towards its mean as time passes, to be pulled down to its mean. If I had a value below the mean, I'd be expecting it to be pulled up towards the mean. And if you want to think of a practical example where that may happen, is for example betas. There's a theory that says betas, companies betas, have a mean reverting level of 1, so cyclical stocks will get a little bit less cyclical, and defensive stocks will get a little bit less defensive over time, as they sort of mature towards a more average level of systematic risk. Now, logically, if I'm already at the mean reverting level, what is my best guess for tomorrow's uh, level of the variable? And you guessed it. I expect the variable to flatline, because I'm already at mean reversion. So, in other words, if I go back to AR1 and say, OK, exit time t is B0 plus B1 xt minus 1, well, at mean reversion, there is no longer distinction between xt and xt minus 1. So I can rewrite that equation as x is b0 plus b1 x, right? Now I can rearrange that and say x minus b1 x is equal to b0. But I can do better than that. 
I can factor out the x and I can say that x open bracket 1 minus b1 is equal to b0. And I've run out of space, so I'm going to move that way now. Okay? Great space management, isn't it? Now, what I'm going to say is x has to be b0 over 1 minus b1, which will represent my mean reverting level. That is my mean reverting level. Okay, so that is the mean reverting level of an AR1 model. But this equation also tells me something more interesting. Think about what it's telling me. It's telling me that I got to be very careful as to the value of the B1. Because if that value happens to be equal to 1, then I get a value divided by 0. And if you don't believe me, try it on your business analyst calculator. Not even that guy knows the answer. It will give you error number 1. Because mathematically, we don't want to divide by 0. So having a slope coefficient of 1 is going to be a massive problem in this type of model. Okay, and that's why we've got a slide or slides on this a little bit later. So keep that thought, keep the thought of B1 equals to 1 being a problem, and we'll come back to this, okay, in just a short while. Uh, we want to uh, also look at the accuracy of your models, and we also want to define a couple of buzzwords, in sample versus out of sample. So in sample is quite simply the data used to develop your model. Okay, typically what the researcher will do is he's going to develop the model based on certain set of data and then test the data on that period. And of course the model will work beautifully because that was the data that was used to develop the model. So really you shouldn't be testing your models on in-sample data. All those models will work well on in-sample data. What we want to see is what's the real predictive power of this model. So go and test them on outer sample data, data that is outside of the um, range of values used to develop the model. Not only that, we've got a metric. we got a metric for you. You need to compute what's called the RMSC based on the outer sample data. So RMSC is exactly what it says on the tin. It's the root of the mean squared error. And if you're familiar with the multiple regression reading, you would probably know that that is called a standard error of the estimate, which is conceptually the standard deviation of the error term, which was a proxy for how accurate our models are. So the upshot is quite simply Use out a sample data, work out your RMSC, and pick the model with the lowest RMSC. Okay, and also we got a slide that reminds us of parameter instability. Okay, parameter instability as in the betas, guys. So you can develop models and work out betas, no problem there. But the problem is these betas change over time. Take another sample, the estimate change. Take a larger sample, smaller sample, the estimates change. So ultimately we've got a trade-off between how reliable our models are. So if you want a really reliable model, take a large sample. And the problem is, You've got also the fact that if you take a smaller sample, maybe it's less reliable, but you've got more valid answers because they're more relevant to what's happening in today's market. So there is a trade-off there. There is a trade-off there. And of course, you have to think about whether the underlying forces have changed, perhaps. Now, Remember, I made a promise that we are going to talk about the fact that B1 equals 1 is a problem, and this is where I'm going to keep my promise. B1 equals to 1 is known as a unit root. Okay, unit root. So, in an AR1 model, 
that B1 must always be less than 1. Because if the B1 is equal to 1, i.e. if we've got a unit root, then the autoregressive model turns into something called a random walk. Okay, and we'll see this as soon as next slide. Um, and essentially, in the 90s, when stock markets were all bullish and it was all happy days, everything was going up, essentially we saw a lot of unit roots. So in, in trending markets, we tend to see unit roots and we tend to get uh, time series that are not covariant stationary. So you've got to be careful when you're operating with the spirits. Now, what is a random walk? Well, the defining characteristic is, of course, that of the unit root. So this is an AR1 model where the B1 is equal to 1. So there you go. That is your simplest example of a random walk. X at time t is equal to x t minus 1 plus epsilon. If you want, if you prefer, you can stick in your unit root in front of the x to see that. It is indeed there. And, and you can see, by just looking at this equation, you can actually see why we call it a random walk. So you may have heard the expression, foreign exchange fx is a random walk. So you can't really predict it. It won't come as good news to fx traders. So essentially what we are saying is the best predictor of tomorrow's exchange rate is basically what the value of the exchange rate is today plus guess what? Something that by definition cannot be predicted. This random step, this epsilon. So this is what we call a random walk without a drift. If you want to have a drift, the drift is basically the intercept. Okay? But the key point, guys, is not the drift. You can have it with a drift or without a drift. The key point is that random walks have a unit root. And if you've got a unit root, you got a big problem, as we can see on the very next slide. And here's the problem. The problem is that you're dividing by zero, and that is undefined. So uh, if you don't have a mean reverting level, then the time series is non-stationary. So you lose that virtue of covariance stationarity. And of course, because it's such a big problem, we need to know how we test for unit roots. So to answer that question, we move on to the slide on the Dickey Fuller test for unit roots. So here are some names, couple of names you would want to memorize. Is that a Dickey and Fuller test for a unit root? Now, we are going to transform our autoregressive model, however. We are going to subtract x t minus 1 from both sides of the equation. So instead of modeling x at time t as a function of b0 plus b1 x t minus 1, I'm going to subtract this guy from the left hand side and similarly I'll subtract it from the right hand side so the right hand side will turn into this particular equation. Uh, and what I'm going to do at that point is I'm going to define b1 minus 1 to be equal to G1, okay? Because you might think, you might think logically that the most direct way to test for a unit would be, would be a null hypothesis that says B1 is equal to 1, yeah? You might think that. Nothing wrong. The problem is that, look, if you indeed have a unit root, then you don't have covariant stationary, then the model's not reliable. So, in other words, the statistical outputs will not be reliable. So, for that reason, Dickey and Fuller define this G1 equal to B1 minus 1. Now, think about it. What you need to focus on is what will be the value of G if I have a unit root. Well, if I stick in a 1 here, G becomes equal to 0. So, what's important, you guys, is that when the value of G in the Dickey Fuller is equal to 0, we've got a unit root to worry about. Moving on now to the actual hypothesis. So in our hypothesis is that G1 is equal to 0. We just said what that meant, don't we? 
B1 equals 1 implies G1 equals 0. So failure to reject the null hypothesis would mean that we have a unit root. If, on the other hand, we were able to reject the, the null hypothesis, that would then mean that we don't have a unit root. So, uh, if, 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 for example, B1, so G is equal to B1 minus 1, if my B1 was 0 0.8, then G will be minus 0 0.2. So indeed, g will be less than zero. So that would imply I do not have a unit root. Now, the test is conducted by calculating a t-statistic. However, it is compared, that computed t-statistic is compared to a revised set of critical values that were computed by Dickey and Fuller. Okay, but by far, the most important thing you want to take away at this stage is that if the null is rejected, then there is no evidence of a unit root and therefore you're more confident that the autoregressive model is Scaveria stationary. But suppose, worst case, uh, we fail to reject the null hypothesis of the Dickey-Fuller. Indeed, G1 is equal to zero. As a result, we now know there's evidence of a unit root. Is there anything we can do about it? And what we can do about it is called first differencing. First differencing essentially is the idea that instead of modeling the absolute value of x at time t versus the absolute value of x at t minus 1, we are going to model the difference or the change of x today versus the change in the x variable in the prior period. So in other words, we define y to be the change in x between today and the prior period. Now think about it. If that was a random walk without a drift, this would be equal to epsilon at time t. So what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to end up modeling this y today versus y from the prior period. But essentially what I'm modeling is the change in x at time t versus the change in x at time t minus 1. And I'm going to define a new error term called mu. Mu will be my new error term. Think about what the change in x is. Well, the change in x is nothing but the error term today, which I'm modeling as a function of the error term from prior period, plus mu t, which is the new error term. Now, what did we say about the error terms? Well, these guys are random. They're completely unrelated. The implication of this is that b0 has to be equal to b1, has to be equal to 0. Now, knowing this, let's try a mean reverting level computation. b0, 1 minus b1. Okay, let's plug in some numbers here. 0 divided by 1 minus 0. What happens? Well, a mean reverting level is 0. And you might think, well, that's not very exciting. But it is. But it is. Because we started with a random walk. The random walk did not have a mean reverting level. The random walk was not covariant stationary. We first differenced your random walk and we basically made it covariant stationary because it now has a well-defined mean reverting level. So, visually, let's have a look at what that would look like. Okay, here we've got some kind of trend. So, I'm going to guess that this, um, this time series is a good candidate for a unit root, has no mean reversion tends to be trending upwards, like the markets of the 90s. I may apply the Dickey-Fuller test to convince myself that indeed I've got a unit root. And if that is indeed the case, I will then proceed to first difference the series 
and model that instead. Notice that the new series has a mean reverting level of zero. Now you probably notice that it's pretty random, right? So you may think, okay, you first difference this thing, but you're not going to make money out of it, are you? You're not going to find a pattern in this? And that is exactly the point. If you were to start with a, with a random walk, and ignore the problem of the unit root, you will get artificially high R squared and F, and you might actually incorrectly conclude, hey, you know what, there's value to trading random walks. But if you correctly first difference your random walks, and make them, convert them into covariant stationary patterns, then when you look at your R squareds, your Fs, you'll actually discover that those numbers are very low. So it effectively confirms the fact that the random walk was indeed something that was not predictable. Now we also need to look at the problem of seasonality. Okay, so uh, basically what we're looking at here is a, a business that may be prone to seasonal changes. So for example, I expect to sell a lot more around Christmas than other parts of the year. Right? My business is seasonal, it's exposed to Christmas, to festivities. Right? And now again, if I start with an AR1 model that simply says, okay, the, no the dollar sales in the month of uh, December are only related to the dollar sales in the month of November, right? AR1 model, one month lag, I'm not going to be telling you the whole picture because I'm ignoring the seasonal component. So what the objective here is to bring in the seasonal component into the picture and to improve the forecasting accuracy of your model. So here's your AR1 model. An over table, by the way, on an AR1 model. Remember, the degrees of freedom of summer squared regression should be equal to the number of independents. So we've got only one lagged independent variable, right, in an AR1 model. Uh, what am I going to be looking at? Quite a lot of data here. For example, the residual degrees of freedom are n minus k minus 1, equal to 68. Sample size is equal to 70. What are the most important numbers here? Well, this is an important number, isn't it? The F tells me the overall validity of the model. This is a high F, guys. Trust me, this is a high F. You can work it out by taking the MSR divided by the MSC, and if, you, if you're not convinced that it is high, you can look up your critical F value. But you will definitely reject the null hypothesis that the slopes are zero. So the model looks to be doing a good job. The second port of call is, of course, to look at the coefficients. I don't want to be seeing any unit roots, as you can imagine. Well, I'm going to be focusing on this guy, right, the lag. I don't want, to, I don't want this value to be, to be 1. Indeed, I want it to be less than 1, as it is the case here. The third port of call is to look at the computed t-statistic. Notice that the absolute value of this t-statistic exceeds the magic number 2. So that lag 1 slope coefficient is actually fairly significant. That is good news. Or, if you prefer, you could have compared the p-value of this slope to the significance of the test, which was 5%. And again, that will tell you the lag one is significant. So, there are three pieces of good news for you here. High F, no unit root, and significant lag one. But, of course, the next thing you need to look at is uh, whether seasonality may be present. So, again, I'm just going to focus on the key columns here. And, of course, you may imagine our key columns are the T columns. And I would observe that lag 1, 2, 10, 11, and 12 exceed the absolute value of 2 which is our critical T value. So I am exhibiting residual autocorrelation at like 1, 2, 10, 11, and 12. That's quite a lot of problems. But not only that, I'm noticing something very interesting. 
whilst 1, 2, 10 and 11 are significant, leg 12 is especially significant. So what that means is that the error term from my December sales appears to be very highly correlated with the error term from the same month, 12 months ago, December of the prior year. And that could be a little hint that maybe my Air 1 model is omitting a seasonal component. So what I now want to do is I want to bring that seasonal component into the model. So not only modeling December sales by looking at November, which is the first bit of the model, but also looking at December from the prior year. And of course, if I do that, which is, as you can see, a little bit about, there's no, 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 there's no right answer. Often the researcher simply tries different things until they find something that works. But let's say with a bit of wishful thinking, I believe seasonality is the only issue. I then go ahead and recompute my ANOVA table. Notice that the number of independents will have increased to two because I now have two lag variables. And look at the F test. It has absolutely skyrocketed. This is definitely a significant F indicating that overall the model works. Look at my lag slopes. They are not unit roots. Look at my T statistics. Both lag one and lag two are statistically significant because the computed T stat exceeds two in absolute terms. So again, all good news as far as the ANOVA table is concerned. Let's look at the residual auto correlations. And this time notice that none of the 12 residual auto correlations exceed the magic number two. So in fact, in none of the 12 cases do I reject my null, the correlation is zero. So in other words, I don't have serial correlation present in this model any longer because I fixed it by incorporating the offending seasonal component that was omitted from the original model. Okay, I hope you found it useful. We're going to change direction now. We're going to look at something called autoregressive conditional header wall scatter system models. Sounds very scary, but really there's very, very, very little you need to know here. So first of all, you remember the problem of header wall scatter statistic. This was when the variance of the error was non-constant. And the idea of conditional header wall scatter was that this variance depending on the value of x. So you may remember that standard errors would be too low, t stats would be too high, it will lead to type 1 errors, all sorts of problems and ultimately wrong conclusions from your models. Now one solution was to use generalized least square regression as opposed to our ordinary least square regression. But there's something else you can do. If you've got conditional header row statistics in your error term, essentially what that's telling me is my errors are not random. Well, that's kind of bad, but it's also kind of good news. Because if you've got non-randomness in your error term, might you not be able to exploit it in order to predict the future? Let's have a look. So, in an arch one pattern, Again, we use this notation, arch1, which basically means that we only look at the first lag of the errors. In an arch1 pattern, we start by testing whether the errors behave in a certain way we want them to. So we regress the squared residual today against the squared residual from the prior period, and we are mostly interested in the value of A1. So our now hypothesis is that A1 is equal to zero, but our alternative is that A1 is different from zero. And we're really hoping to find that A1 is different from zero. What that will basically now mean is that the error term today is linearly related to the error term from prior period, and therefore, these errors are following what we call an arch-1 pattern. 
If we have demonstrated that A1 is significant, then we can move to step two of the exercise. Step two of the exercise is basically to forecast the variance of the error in the next period by plugging in the residual error, the residual value squared today. Okay? So we are forecasting the variance of error by using data that's available from today's trading data. So essentially what Arch is, it's basically a vol forecasting model. It allows us to forecast what volatility might be in the future. And of course, option sellers will care about that. Because when you sell options, you're short vol strategy. If volatility increases and you've sold options, you stand to lose a lot of money, a lot more money than what you've collected in the form of premium. And lastly, in this reading, we need to look at multiple time series. Okay, so basically the question here is, let's say we take one time series, which is the return of a stock across time, and we regress that against the return of the market against time. Both of these are time series. And when we regress them in simple linear regression, remember that the slope of this regression was our B1, which is also our systematic risk or beta of the stock. Now, here's my question for you guys. Can we trust that beta estimate if we've got unit roots in this time series? Because we obviously know that unit roots can be very problematic. So this could have a unit root. This could have a unit root. Both could have a unit root. None could have a unit root. Right? In which cases can I actually trust my beta estimate if this time series are random walks? Well, let me give you the answers. Now, as you may imagine, if both time series are covariant stationary, then your beta estimate is reliable. So, the B1 is less than 1. In both cases, your beta is fairly reliable. But if only the dependent variable, either the stock return, or only the independent variable, either the market return is covariant stationary, but the other one is a random walk, then interestingly, we, 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 cannot, do the, we cannot trust our beta estimate. The beta estimate becomes unreliable. And logically, one might think, okay, well, if they were both random walks, then, then it'd probably be even worse. But actually, there is an exception. If both of them are uh, random walks, or in other words, neither of them are covariant stationary, then what we could do is we could check for cointegration. Now, cointegration... Uh, is, 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 uh, the test for cointegration is performed by the Engel-Granger test. Okay, we won't go into the mechanics of the Engel-Granger test, but I will tell you what cointegration is. Well, cointegration is when two time series are related to the same macroeconomic variables or at least follow the same trend. So if you think about the stock return, if you think about the market return, well, both stocks and markets should be at least sensitive to the same macroeconomic variables. And they may well follow the same trend. So we find generally that this series are co-integrated even when they are random walks. And therefore, our beta estimates are reliable. And we can, we can trust our beta estimates. Good news. Okay, and this is just a uh, summary slide of everything we've seen uh, so far. So I suggest once you have recapped this in your, in your own time, have a look at this slide and just make sure that it still makes sense. 
Right, we are basically nearing the end of this time series reading. I know it was abstract. I know at times it might have looked scary, especially when we use the words conditional, had a wall, scatter, this, the auto regression, and so on. But the upshot is a lot of it is conceptual and very little, little of it is actually computationally intense. So focus on the big picture here, focus on the meanings of things, and keep pushing with your studies. All the best and hope to see you for another wonderful reading. Goodbye.